We're at the ARC Forum in Orlando, Florida, and I'm Ralph Rio with ARC Advisory Group. One of the hot topics at this year's forum is the industrial internet of things. And we are privileged to have a conversation with Mike Triano of AT&T, and he is the vice president of the industrial internet of things for that company. Mike, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Now, AT&T is uh, not all that well known to my knowledge for uh, industrial internet of things. So could you talk a little bit at a high level about your strategy or uh, around uh, the internet of things? I sure can, thank you again. Pleasure to be here with you and the team. So we actually started the journey almost 12 years ago in terms of wirelessly connecting, cellular connecting machines throughout mostly America. What we're seeing now is more of a trend toward global expansion as companies want to connect to these machines. Um, when I think about the business <clears throat> that got us here over the last number of years, it started off very much with companies just trying to connect, right? And could wireless actually be fortified enough and reliable enough versus a wireline piece of infrastructure? And so companies really started to force us to make sure our platforms were scalable, robust enough, and it really allowed us to change the strategy over the last couple of years where we actually just last year announced a new organization called IoT Solutions. And to your point, I run the industrial side of that business. And just to compare and contrast, right, you know, you think about some of the consumer IoT solutions. You might have a wearable that you use to, to track your paces. Well, if you left your wearable at home, it wouldn't be the end of the world, right? Things would not come to a crashing halt. But if a big company like a GE can't talk to a jet engine or a locomotive, or Rockwell Autom Automation can't talk to some of the machines on the plant floor, you could have adverse impact not only to their business, but ultimately the industry. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, this is really around how do we help to build fortifiable, scalable solutions for industry that we know are built very different than consumer solutions, and quite frankly, have to perhaps be out in the environment for seven, 10 plus years. And so the way we build that, how we tie back into back-end infrastructure, how we deal with device manufacturers and the application partners, it's very different. And so we said, let's build out a business unit just to focus on industrial solutions. Wow, so what I heard in there a little bit is that there is uh, some substantial infrastructure needed to do the industrial internet of things. Uh, can you talk about how AT&T fits into that infrastructure? Maybe talk a little bit about the applications that you're involved in. I'll actually start at the foundation level, right? Because without the foundation, nothing up the stack really matters. Uh, we built out a very robust set of tools to allow companies to manage these connections again, on a global basis and very scalable. We have some companies that may just look at how do I wirelessly connect 10 or 15 units all the way up to customers that truly have over a million assets that are managed with our platforms today. And what's important at the foundational element, it's not only about cellular connectivity, that's where I spend a lot of my, my time talking, but many companies are coming to us saying, listen, I actually need these solutions to be communication path agnostic. For example, I might be tracking a heavy piece of equipment that's been manufactured in some parts of the world that needs satellite connectivity, whereas in other parts of the world I need 3G or 4G wireless cellular technology. I might have other assets that I need Wi-Fi connectivity or Ethernet connectivity. So we try to engineer things in a, in a communication agnostic model. When you move up the stack, a lot of companies, especially in the industrial space, that are now trying to think about how do I take these assets and cellularly connect them, they don't have necessarily the skill set or the, or the wherewithal to think through how radio propagation can impact the communication technology. You've had a wire going into that machine for 10, 20 years in the factory floor, but as you start to move to the outside environment, how does that change things? And one thing that I would tell you is that <clears throat> when companies come into our labs for certification, all the devices must be certified on the network, the number one reason, in fact, almost 80% of the reasons why devices fail our, our testing is because of the way the radio has been designed and the way the antenna impacts the performance of that device. So we help companies think through that, right? That's not necessarily you know, the DNA of a lot of big manufacturers to, to understand that. And then as you move up the stack and you think about from an application standpoint, most of these big uh, manufacturing companies, you, there's nothing off the shelf that they can grab in terms of an application that allows them to talk to legacy equipment, right? And so we help them from the application development and design as well as hosting and managing. So it really is a full stack approach uh, I've had a number of people ask or, or mention in the, just the last few hours as I've been at the conference today, they said, you know, I never knew AT&T did those things. And, you know, they think of us traditionally as a communication partner, but 
when you're thinking about industrial solutions, you have to be able to have the conversation all the way up the stack, inclusive of security, right? And there's a lot of conversation about how do you ensure that these devices are, are secure. So that's where I spend my time. So uh, as you talk through that, I imagine that to provide a complete solution, you must have some partners. Uh, can you talk a little bit, maybe perhaps, about some of the key partnerships you have to, to kind of provide a total solution that a, a, a customer can actually use and get some benefit out of? Well, the premise is, is awesome that you bring up, which is it is about partners. I, one thing that I do say to a lot of enterprise customers is you can't do it alone. And I'd also challenge enterprise customers to think through some of the technology companies they may have worked with in the past may not necessarily be the best partners for where they want to go relative to industrial solutions. And so that ecosystem has to be perhaps better vetted. Um, we joined actually and helped create something last year with companies like IBM, Intel, Cisco, GE, called the Industrial Internet Consortium. And now there are over 100 companies that are part of this. But it's a good example of how companies can come together and start to work on best practices, perhaps even start to think through how you influence regulatory, not only domestically, but again, if you're thinking about a, a global environment. The last point that I would, I would touch on, we actually built out an asset uh, about three years ago called the AT&T Foundry. And it's a very specific location, it's a building, if you will, uh, right outside of Dallas, Texas, that we bring the best engineers, both software and hardware from AT&T, the best engineers from the ecosystem, as well as the enterprise customer into this environment. And we'll spend a couple days ideating on what the, the problem is, the problem statement for the customer. We'll put these folks together in a room and we'll say, go build something, build a, pro, a proof of concept in two or three or six weeks, right? That you can then present back to the enterprise. And so the beauty of where we sit on the stage, if you will, is that we see a lot of different ecosystem partners and we can help vet best in class partners and bring them to the table faster than some of the, the end enterprise customers can go through their own evaluation process. Well, when we start talking about solutions and uh, implementing them, uh, we often start to think about what are the benefits. Uh, because somebody in the end has got to f justify uh, this new technology. It isn't technology just for technology's sake. There's got to be some benefit behind it. So in, in some of the applications you've been involved in, is uh, maybe you could talk about a specific instance or in general, what kind of benefits would uh, someone be expecting with an industrial Internet of Things type solution? Well, again, premise is, is awesome, right? When I think about, and I talk to a lot of customers about this, we'll solve a technology nine times out of 10. But it's the broader business impact that really has to be wrestled to the ground. In fact, if I look back on the last few months, the number of meetings I've had with CEOs or even chief marketing or chief strategy officers, it's been remarkable because these companies understand, these, these individuals, that if they don't start the journey now, they could wake up in two or three years and realize the business has been transformed, the industry has been transformed, and they're no longer relevant. But you've got to start that journey. So I, I agree with the premise of the question. But I'll give you a good example. Um, late last year, we had uh, Monsanto into our briefing center in, in Dallas, and we got into this conversation about supply chain logistics. And we had just introduced a high-value air cargo asset tracking device. It's a very simple device that looks at temperature, humidity, it can look at what we call light or seal control to see if someone's tampered with, a, with an object. And the CIO of Monsanto immediately jumped on this and he said, send me a couple of these things. We're doing some things in Latin America and I want to see if this product off the shelf would, would fit our, our world. Last week, unbeknownst to us, um, in CIO Magazine, if you're familiar with that magazine, the CIO of Monsanto was interviewed and he went on at length about the AT&T CargoView solution. And what he went on to say was, if you think about um, agriculture for a minute. We'll, we'll pick on that, that part of the world. You know, a tractor goes through a field, it, it digests the corn or wheat or whatever it might be uh, combining, it then takes that and shoots that off into another tractor, the grain, right? Mm -hmm. That bin that's now full goes off to the side of the farm, they park it. They bring in another bin. The, the corn or grain comes from the tractor, hits the bin, and they sta stage these things. What they realized after they put our asset tracking device into the bottom of the bin, was that in Mexico and Brazil, the temperature was so warm in these days when they were actually in the fields that the genetic makeup of the grain was starting to change. And they got that information from the sensors that we put into that. And, and um, from that, they then determined they should move some of these things up in the processing 
line as opposed to having spoilage. So it's a good example of how some very simple solutions can give a company insight that otherwise could have left, led to spoilage or loss within the operation. So I think it's important for companies that are thinking through this. Are you trying to solve a problem around operational efficiency? Or perhaps is there an opportunity also to actually open up a new revenue stream for the company and really expand your business? Mike, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. We've been speaking with Mike Criano of AT&T. Thank you for listening.